guys, I'm Janet, on occasion, and uh, today we're continuing our uh, sort of Sigmar trilogy. You know, 11.5, 0.6, and now 0.7. So, uh, yeah, bring you a lot of this stuff, because you might notice I'm not bringing you any battle replays at the moment. That's because I cannot get a good match at the moment. Um, either I pick an army that, you know, you could make a cheesy build out of, and uh, people are just quitting before we even start the match. Or, you know, if I'm not doing that, the other person is picking a really cheesy army. So I haven't had a decent fight in ages. Um, but I am uh, I'm hoping to bring some more, like, YouTuber battles onto the uh, onto the channel at some point. But that takes time to do. So um, so that's a pity. But, you know, um, I'm happy to do more lore play stuff. So hopefully that's a good, you know, a good uh, compromise. So if I'm not, you know, bringing you a load of battles, I'm bringing you a load of lore play. So um, hopefully you're all okay with that. Um, you know, let me know. Um, if not, I, I might just have to throw in some of the cheesy battle replays if that's what you really want to see. But um, I'm assuming if you're here, you know, watching sort of part three of the Sigma stuff, you're quite happy to be listening to the lore play stuff. So maybe you're not the right people to ask. I don't know. Um, unless you like both. In which case, yeah, let me know. So um, guys, uh, obviously the previous one, um, I was sort of leading up to uh, talking about the witch hunters. So that's what I'm going to start with. And uh, also... Um, I am going to be talking about Volkmar, probably in a campaign episode, seeing as how he's always with us. Um, so I won't be talking about the Grand Theogenist, despite the fact that he is a big part of Sigmar. He's the head of the cult. So um, you know, I will be talking about him outside of this, um, which might seem a bit strange, but I think that's probably the best way to balance it up. So anyway, I've waffled on far too long um, for this you know, preamble, so uh, let's get into it. So anyway, uh, Witch Hunters. So, the Imperial authorities legislate heavily against heresy and employ witch hunters to sniff out the worshippers of the Dark Gods. Sanctioned witch hunters are members of the Holy Order of the Templars of Sigma, a militant arm of the Cult of Sigma, but are controlled by both the Grand Theogenist and the Emperor. Not even the priesthood or the state is above suspicion of heresy, and this arrangement ensures that neither can uh, prejudice the witch hunters' investigations. Members of the Templars of Sigma seek out secret chaos cults, hidden mutants and unsanctioned sorcerers, and have the authority to detain suspects at will. Some work alone, while others recruit warriors, priests, and wizards to help them. The enemy is cunning and deadly, so witch hunters use any means necessary to get the truth. Torture is a common method of interrogation, not only to, to secure a confession, but also to force a prisoner to implicate collaborators. Cultists and witches rarely operate on their own. Once a heretic has confessed, he and any other accomplices are brought to trial presided over by the witch hunter himself. It is testimony to the witch hunter's efficiency that very few heretics escape justice. The guilty are sentenced to be drowned, impaled, hung by the neck, nailed to a tree, or burned on a pyre. Repentance is never an option. Many empire folk fear witch hunters, perhaps rightfully, uh, rightly so, for some witch hunters have been known to condemn entire villages to flame, on account of a single transgression of the heresy laws. However, witch hunters um, execute their duties to protect the Empire. If a few innocents must die for the greater good, then so be it. Multitudes would perish should a chaos cult summon a rampaging demon, or should a witch hunter, uh, a witch wither fertile cornfields. So, um, yeah, uh, I think I've actually read this before in a previous episode, uh, when we recruited a witch hunter. Um, but, it's all about Sigma. this episode, um, which is why it's been going on for so long. There's a lot of stuff around Sigma, So uh, I'm just going to keep going with it, frankly. Um, this is going to be, you know, really... This is going to make up for the fact I haven't got a few videos up, remember that. So, um, yeah. So the next uh, next bit here, uh, it goes on to more about, um, you know, witch hunters. So I'm going to continue. The Order of the Templars of Sigma is an organisation that enjoys the gruesome and terrifying reputation of being the witch hunters. The broad-brimmed hat, brace of pistols, and propensity towards mass burnings, uh, that are the hallmarks of witch hunters in the minds of the common people, are all associated with this ze uh, zealous group. Long supported and funded by the Cult of Sigma, these witch hunters are granted their uh, powers by the cult and the Empire. A witch hunter's holy duty is to protect the Empire and its citizens from the infernal powers, their allies and those who would serve them. Uh, this includes demons, servants of demons, Chaos uh, cultists, worshippers of the dark gods, chaos sorcerers, necromancers, mutants, beastmen, and undead creatures. They are dedicated to the eradication of witches, including hedge wizards, warlocks, petty sorcerers, fortune tellers, unsanctioned users of magic, deviants, blasphemers, or sinners in general. Indeed, there are few who escape the suspicions of these witch hunters, with the possible exception of other Templars of Sigma. 
Many witch hunters specialize in a particular field of investigation and spend years or even decades traveling the Empire to track all the members of a certain cult or on the trail of a particular priest of a dark god. So uh, they did have their favorite thing to, you know, hunt down endlessly. Um, so dedicated bunch, you know. So um, anyway, uh, so the origins of the witch hunters lie in the Order of the Silver Hammer. The order is reputed to have been created by Sigmar himself as a secret order to safeguard terrible items of great power and mystery. It is said that Sigmar initiated the first head of the order, um, Wolfgart Krieger, after he aided Sigmar in his duel against Nagash. That's right, Sigmar fought Nagash at some point, um, which I guess we should probably talk about at some point. Hmm. Um, in 1682, the Grand Theogenist, uh, Seibold II, officially recognized the order and tasked it with the defense of the Empire. Despite this recognition, the Order still operated in almost complete and utter secrecy. After the Great War Against Chaos, the new Emperor, Magnus the Pious, decreed that the Empire would be better protected by the citizens of the Empire, being openly aware of the existence of the Order. To this effect, he changed the Order's name to the Holy Order of the Templars of Sigmar, and officially sanctioned it. The newly renamed Order zealously embraced its new status, resulting in the infamous purges of 2006, uh, 2306, which ended in the deaths of nearly 600 heretics, several notable burgomeisters, and even an archlector. So, um, that's a lot like the Spanish Inquisition, isn't it? That kind of sudden, let's get busy killing everyone. Um, pretty grim. Uh, so was born the un uh, unnerving reputation of the zealous witch hunters, and the general population learned to fear and respect them. The reforms Emperor, uh, Emperor Magnus brought in... Um, brought in were an attempt to have the witch hunters established as an institution woven into the fabric of the empire, thereby becoming a visible extension of both the state and the cult of Sigma, and a direction and command of the, both the emperor and the Grand Theogenist. So uh, the changes were political though, and the order's task, um, task in the same as it has been for hundreds of years, the witch hunters will serve as judge, jury, and executioner. They have the power to arrest any imperial citizen they believe is guilty of witchery or demon worship and can call for that person to be tried at once, a request very few nobles or burgomeisters refuse. In theory, the accused has the right to a trial, though it is up to the individual witch hunter to determine if the offences are grievous enough to bypass a trial and end in summary judgment. As one can imagine, given the witch hunter's fearsome reputations, very few uh, such accusations end in trial. On those exceedingly rare occasions when a trial does occur, often a political concession for an accused person of some social standing, the witch hunter serves as chief litigant for the accused, as well as chief prosecutor. Since there are so few laws on uh, evidentiary, uh, evidentiary matters, the uh, prosecutors use oratory, implication, suspicion, and even veiled threats to persuade a lord, judge, or magistrate of the accused's guilt. If found guilty, and most people accused and brought to trial by a witch hunter are found guilty, the usual sentence for the accused is death by burning. Thought to be the only way to destroy the body and purge its foul spirit at the same time. While some witch hunters endeavour to condemn only the guilty to the pyre, others are less scrupulous. In fact, many believe that everyone is guilty of something. As a consequence, witch hunters are feared throughout the empire. Still, it's widely agreed that only uh, the only thing more frightening than witch hunter is the threat of chaos unchecked by its endeavours. So that was uh, again from Tome of Blessings, a uh, third edition supplement part of the corset so where do they uh, where do they uh, operate from uh, that's right it's the witch hunters great temple they have a great temple in uh, in old dorf so uh, the great temple uh, the headquarters of the witch hunters was established in 1220 and built near the holy temple of sigmar in old dorf the stoic sturdy building is nearly as imposing as the witch hunters who congregate there great temple is a vast uh, structure where witch hunters meet to discuss the issues facing the empire Shen interrogation techniques or philosophies on religious matters. Here, witch hunters take advantage of the Great Temple stables and smithy, recover from their wounds in the infirmary, or use its uh, gaol to torture um, or torture chambers to extract the confessions they need. In addition to, this, uh, to its resources for witch hunters, Great Temple is also a chapter house for the Order of the Templars of Sigma. Within its hallowed halls, the Lord Protector, Supreme Council, and Chamberlain of the Order meet to discuss important matters be it threats to the souls of the Empire citizens or disciplinary action against more zealous members of its order. Great Temple is said to house an impressive library. 
The shelves are lined with texts, manuscripts, and scrolls detailing faith, history, and heresy, such as uh, Aeronymous uh, Black's Rules and Statutes, considered the authoritative work on the founding tenets and strictures of the order. However, it is whispered that within the library, darker, more esoteric things lurk. Hidden away within the library, copies of the dread Liber Malefic and Liber Chaotica lie waiting for those brave or foolish enough to glean the terrible insights they hold. So, um, yeah, so I think that pretty much sums it up for the, um, for the, uh, Witch Hunters, I think. Actually, no, I'm going to tell you about a Witch Hunter as well. So, uh, oh, that previous bit, um, was from, uh, Signs of Faith, another third edition supplement, and, uh, this next bit also is. So, um, this is actually about a Witch Hunter in particular, uh, called Magnus Felberg. So, Felberg is a name that might strike fear into the heart of even the most innocent Imperial citizen. He is a Witch Hunter of the Holy Order of the Templars of Sigmar, and rarely has that order, um, uh, Rarely has that order have been served by such an enthusiastic and ruthless member. With all the authority of the Grand Theogenist behind him, the man is able to prose uh, prosecute his war with the forces of darkness across the Reichland. He believes that allowing a simple servant of the Dark Gods to go free is so dangerous to the survival of the Empire that he is willing to sacrifice the lives of hundreds of innocents to prosecute Sigmar's judgement. This was amply demonstrated when he destroyed the entire village of Beckheim, burning every one of its inhabitants to make certain that the suspected chaos cultist hiding there could not escape. For his great service, Felberg has been granted a hammer from the vaults of the Great Temple. It is said to be imbued with magical properties, and its creation was commanded by Sigmar himself when he was Emperor. So that's pretty cool. So, a witch hunter with a hammer. Uh, I want to see that, because yeah, they've all just got swords. It's a bit... Eh, no, hammers. That's, that's where it's at. Okay, so I had to scour some books for, um, for the... Uh, Nagash Sigma thing, which of course I'm going to mention. It's Nagash, right? And uh, and Sigma, like that's pretty epic. Uh, but this is this is blatantly been retconned. Um because yeah, this is the uh, this is fourth, I think fourth edition, uh, possibly third edition, Undead um, Warhammer Army's book. So this is before it got split up between Vampire Gans and Tomb Kings. It's an old book, and uh, you know when Nagash was a, a model, you could have. And, uh, you know, it was one of the main models you'd, ha you'd pick in an undead army. Um, but yeah, uh, so, um, I'm gonna read about Nagash now. Um, obviously there's a lot of his- this is sort of- this is an undead book, right? So it's not really about Sigmar, it's about Nagash. So, it might be a bit odd, the perspective might change a bit, but anyway. So this is after, uh, well after, uh, Nagash was killed by, um, al Qadizar of the, um, you know, Tomb Kings fame. Um, but yeah, so, uh, in, in this sort of story, um, he's very much like Sauron, right? So, uh, all of, all the sort of, uh, ashes, essentially, is pretty much just a load of soot. Um, but they slowly coalesced over, you know, millennia, and, uh, started turning into a body again. And he came back, and, um, you know, that's pretty good. So, uh, yeah, yeah, very, very slim. Uh, but yeah, that all happened, um, in his Black Pyramid, which, you know, he sort of bound himself to. So he came back, but um, a lot of his stuff was missing. So he's going on a quest to go find his old toys, right? And uh, uh, I think the main thing that made it difficult was his uh, was his sorcerer's um, uh, crown, which uh, I'm pretty sure is the crown that uh, what's his name? What's the orc? Um, Azag. Azag wears. He he found the uh, the crown of sorcery. That was Nagash's hat. Yeah, anyway. So, uh, so yeah, let's let's get into it. So, say, I will be doing a, um, probably some history on Nagash at some point. But, you know, Sigma. So, um, at this point, uh, Nagash basically um, was holed up in a, uh, some long abandoned ruins of an elven city of uh, Athel Tamara. And uh, this would be his base uh, while he scoured the north. So, he's basically on the border of, um, of Empire lands at this point. So from the ruins, Nagash sent messengers uh, winging out to locate Kadon's heir. This is the person who stole his hat. But Morath was dead. The evil mage had been slain by Sigmar, and the crown was in the possession of the first emperor. Sensing its utter evil, he refused to use it and kept it under lock and key within its treasure vaults, far from the eyes of those who might be tempted by it. And uh, obviously in those treasure vaults, um, yeah, it'd be guarded by um, the guys who would later become the witch hunters. The, uh, you know, them lot. So, uh, Nagash sent a messenger to Sigmar's camp, claiming his crown and offering infinite riches for its return. 
a great cowled figure mounted on a black uh, on the back of a carrion bird descended on the tribesmen. All quailed as the dark uh, figure dismounted and presented its master's demands in a voice like a death rattle. The stench of evil and decay surrounded the messenger, and all who looked upon it became afraid and encouraged their leader to give way. However, Sigmar was not inclined to surrender the crown, and seeing their leader's resolve, the warriors took heart. Their cheering was silenced when the messenger spoke once again, saying that they were fools and that they would not, uh, they would not live to regret their folly. Sigma raised his great hammer, Galmaraz, and smote the undead thing. It collapsed in on itself, leaving only a foul dark cloak behind. Sigma ordered the remains burned. Nagash spent many month, uh, months gathering his strength. His spells raised legions of the dead from their burial mounds, and other dark things came at his call, till a mighty army of the undead was assembled. At last he was ready to make war against Sigmar and his followers. The great army of the Walking Dead marched through the primeval forest of the Empire, killing all those they encountered. Those they killed swelled their army's ranks. Many men were killed and many others driven uh, before the undead army to spread the word of its coming. Nagash understood how potent an ally, uh, potent an ally fear was, and the men of the north were afraid. They had vanquished the orcs and driven all their enemies before them, but now they faced a foe that filled them with dread and was seemingly invincible. Or they only had sig uh, of them only uh, of them all only Sigma was unafraid. Sorry, that took a while to get the sentence out. Uh, he sent to his dwarf allies for aid, and they forged more potent weapons wrapped round with potent magics for the undoing of their necromantic foes. The two armies met on the banks of the River Reich in the late spring of the year um, Imperial Calendar 15, so 15 years after his coronation and the founding of the Empire. It was an evenly matched and bitterly fought contest. The humans and dwarves were resolute. The undead regiments and animated, uh, animated skeletons and walking corpses marched like automatons. Every step perfectly synchronized the beat of a massive human skin drum. And uh, also, they picked up on that in uh, Total War Warhammer. And, you know, with all the really synchronized skeletons. Isn't that great? There is, you know, a mention of it in Warhammer, saying that's how they walk. So, um, yeah, for anyone who's saying, oh, it doesn't look very good. No, no it, it happens. Um, so, Carrion darkened the sky overhead. Vampires stalked through the red murk. Ghouls feasted on the dead and wounded alike. Whites clutched men in their cold grip. The army of Nagash charged and broke like a wave against the, uh, the stolid... Really stolid? Anyway, solid dwarf shield wall. The forces of Sigmar countercharged and a huge general melee broke out, the pitted man against monster in single combat all across the field of battle. Amid all the death, two godlike beings walked. Sigmar led charge after charge by the men of the Umborigens. His awesome warhammer turned him into a living engine of destruction, and he left a wake of ruin behind him as he waded through the foes. Mounted on a great black chariot, Nagash drove through the fray, a howling black rune sword clutched in his mighty metal fist. Uh, in the centre of the battle, the two titans clashed. Sigmar vaulted up onto the running board of the chariot and wrestled with the lick, uh, or lich, however you want to pronounce it. It was a contest of awesome strength that sent the two of them tumbling, from the vehicle to clash onto the honest earth. For an hour, the two fought while the battle rolled on all around them. The gash stabbed Sigmar in the arm, and the wound was poisoned. Feeling his strength seep away, Sigmar launched himself into a final berserk assault. The hammer became a thunderbolt in his hands. He struck home time and time, uh, again driving the great necromancer before him right into the banks of the Reich. Nagash summoned the most potent minions to aid him. Vampires leapt on the first emperor. He struck left and right, crushing them utterly, which is impressive because vampires are ruddy quick and, uh, you know, ruddy strong. They're not. Yeah. And, and he's fighting a gash at the same time. Like, he's, he's good. He's good. You know, you got to give him that. Sensing that his foe was weakening, Nagash stood his ground. Sigmar stood panting before him. Both knew this was the final conflict. The wounded Sigmar threw himself forward once again. His hammer descended like a meteor. Nagash parried and the hammer was halted. For a long moment, the two strained against each other. Sparks flew as their weapons met. The thunder of metal on metal drowned out the screams of the dying. Steel sinews pitted themselves against unnatural vi uh, vitality. Cold blue eyes glared into awful empty sockets. Then at last, Sigmar prevailed, knocking aside the great necromancer's blade and smashing his weapon down on the head of his foe. As the necromancer fell, a dark cloud emerged from his cracked skull and rose like a plume of poison gas over the battlefield before drifting off south. 
The legions, animated by his dark will, collapsed. Skeletons fell into piles of bone, zombies crumbled and fell, decomposing before the eyes of the watchers, till they became pools of rot on the ground. Vampires and ghouls fled into the deep woods. Only when the battle was over did Sigmar stumble and fall. It took the man-god several months to recover from this wound uh, the gash inflicted, and he never regained his full strength. On the other hand, it took the great necromancer many centuries to once more take on mortal form in the great sarcophagus in Kemri. He had learned a bitter lesson. Now there were powers in the world who could catch him. He resolved to be more careful next time. From that day, he has dwelled within uh, Nagashizar, a pale shadow of his former mighty self, and uses a web of agents to do his will. So, um, so that's kind of cool, right? So, um, you know, Sigma fighting the Gash. Um, but of course, that that is, you know, been overtaken with other stories. Um, I think I think they wanted to make Sigma less of a, you know. Less of a character of history and more a character of myth, um, you know, where it's just sort of the other emperors sort of, you know, mimic in his footsteps. Um, so you have Karl Franz, obviously the Battle of Hellfire, um, uh, Black Fire Pass. Um, I think they wanted to make that symmetry better. And I think having um, Karl Franz fight Nagash, it just seems a bit silly. Because Nagash is supposed to be like a godlike being, right? Um, you know, I think, I'm pretty sure in like the end time, I know the end times, the. But when he comes back, um, apparently all the Chaos Gods get scared of him. Um, I've only read the first book, and I was just like, oh, no, can't be bothered. I've actually got another two of books of the um, like, Omnibus on my shelf, but um, yeah, yeah, I haven't even haven't even bothered. Um, <laughs> but from the blurb I've read, um, yeah, all the Chaos Gods are worried, because Nagash seems to be rivaling them in power. So this is the sort of guy we're talking about. Um, so yeah, just having any old person fight him seems a bit silly. But um, Sigma, he can get away with it. So, uh, and he does. Oh, and also I think they want to reserve Nagash for sort of, you know, sort of Tomb Kings and Vampire Camp stories, uh, rather than, you know, just throwing it with the Empire. So, you know, fun all round. Okay, so final bit, I think, final stretch here. Um, I want to talk about some of the, well, a couple of the Templar orders. Um, so, you know, not the, the not the Witch Hunters, but um, other Templar Orders um, of Knights. And, uh, yeah, of Sigma. Because uh, I've got a couple got a couple here uh, to talk about, um, which are especially cool. So, uh, yeah, one, the Knights Griffin. So, the Order of the Knights Griffin was first founded by Magnus the Pious, shortly after the Great War Against Chaos. The Order was originally created from a hundred of the most courageous members of the Knights Panther, who battled to liberate Prague, uh, being in Kislev, Prague. Um, however, unlike the Knight's Panther, the Order was tasked with, uh, tasked with guarding the Temple of Sigmar in Nulm, um, the then Imperial capital. As such, they have become regarded as Templars. Uh, since the ascension of Wilhelm II, the Imperial Court has moved from Nulm to Altdorf, because Magnus created the Knight's Griffin with the express, uh, express purpose of guarding the High Temple of Sigmar in the Empire's capital. The Knights have taken his word literally and relocated to the High Temple of Sigmar in Altdorf. This is a move that has brought them into close proximity with the Order of the Fiery Heart, with whom the Knights Griffin have developed a rivalry. The Knights Griffin wear either lacquered armour of green and gold, or bright steel, though many members also wear black as a sign of their association with Nelm. Their horses, Barding, is, one of, uh, is of the same, or a deep burgundy. They often wear the skins of wild beasts, a legacy of their uh, origins as members of the Knight's Panther, and their heraldry depicts a rampant griffin brandishing a sword. So that's cool. But um, I also mentioned the Fiery Heart, and uh, the reason why there's a rivalry with them is because uh, the Fiery Heart is also um, a Sigmarite um, Templar Order. So uh, the Order of the Fiery Heart has a long and glorious history, dating back to 1360 when Grand Duchess Artilia outlawed the cult of Sigmar in Talabekland, which uh, we mentioned earlier and uh, set the Age of Wars in motion. Devoted to Sigmar, the Order of the Fiery Heart have well-earned reputation as protectors of the Sigmarite faithful, and have been known to serve as guards for temples and priests of Sigmar throughout their history. The Knights are well known for their fanatical zeal, with which they pursue their crusade against orcs and goblins. They are experts at fighting greenskins, their battle uh, the battle skills honed from centuries of battling such enemies. However, the Order is also a force to be reckoned with against any foe. Certain rumours surround the Order. The inner circle of the Knights of the Fiery Heart are said to consult a prophetic work, named the Unfinished Book, a text that most Sigmarite priests uh, regard as apocryphal. 
The Order is also said to obsess over the loss of a particular magical artifact, a sword named Karagul. In decades past, certain members of the Order reported visions of Sigmar telling them to retrieve the blade from beneath the ruined dwarf hold of Carrick Eight Peaks. Every few years, a member of the Order quests to find the blade, and none have returned. The Order of the Fiery Heart colours are white with gleaming plate armour, and their heraldry commonly depicts an imperial cross with a burning heart. So interesting that they uh, they quest to Carrick Eight Peaks, because, uh, you know, anyone who's played Total War Warhammer, and, uh, you know, has played either as uh, Clan Angrand or um, as, uh, what are they called? Uh, the Crooked Moon, you know, with Skarsnik. Uh, they'll they'll know that that is a uh, hotly disputed, uh, very dangerous place, and uh, the Skaven haven't even been put in the game yet. Um, that city is actually a three-way between dwarves, uh, Skaven, and goblins. So um, yeah, not very safe place, you know, to go looking for swords. So uh, it's no wonder none of them come back, because uh, yeah, not not a fun place. So okay, there's uh, two more things I want to cover, which I, I kind of covered in uh, previous uh, lore play videos, but seeing as how this is all about Sigma, and I'm assuming people are coming here to, you know, get the full Sigma thing. Um, cause obviously I've said I'm not going to talk about Volgmar just yet. Uh, but I do want to talk about the Warrior Priests and Flagellants, because they're just core to the, you know, sort of Warhammer fantasy sort of idea of the cult sort of on the battlefield. And of course, you know, you want to know about the battlefield, because, you know, your fans are total war. So, um, you know, so I'm sure you're going to want to hear about them again. So uh, so the Warrior Priests, I'll start with. Uh, so Warrior Priests of Sigmar, in particular, because, you know, Sigmar. So, uh, Sigmar is a warrior god, and his clergy are warrior priests. Sigmar, in his divine all-seeing wisdom, knows that there are many unseen and supernatural evils and horrors which beset mankind, and so channels his own divine power through his chosen priests. The soldiers of the Empire, trusting in their faith, can withstand and turn back the tide of enemies that assail them needing only to hear the priests reciting of Deus Sigma to inspire them to heroism. But it befalls the priest to contend with the foe on the spiritual and magical planes, and this they do with prayers and invocations, almost equal in potency to the spells of wizards, and with the strength of their unflinching minds. Warrior priests of Sigma are a common sight among the armies of the Empire. They are most often seen preaching and prophesying in the ranks of the common soldiers. Sometimes Sigma himself choose, uh, chooses someone to be his messenger. He speaks to him and endows him with a measure of his own spiritual strength, power, and authority. This blessing may fall upon any man, uh, be he noble or commoner. Thus are recruited the clergy of Sigmar's own cult, and it is from among the humble priests that the higher echelons of clerics arise, even unto the powerful positions of lectors or the grand theogonist himself. Every city, town, and village of the Empire has its shrines to Sigmar and priests of his cult. Thus a warrior priest is ready at hand to inspire the people whatever trials may come. Sorry, trials may come. These priests are recognized by their robes, and by the insignia of Sigma which they wear, in particular the image of the Holy Hammer. Warrior priests go about their tasks in castle and camp, blessing the soldiers, healing the wounded, and inspiring everyone with the words of Sigma. When Sigma calls upon his uh, priests to speak, they do so, rousing tired and flagging soldiers to righteous fury with their fervent sermons. Among the many evils which beset the Empire, there are three heresies which a priest of Sigma will recognize instantly and denounce. Uh, these are malign sorcery, the curse of undeath, and the vile worship of chaos. From these evils may holy Sigma deliver us. So, um, so that's pretty cool. It's pretty cool, you know. Um, but, but they're a bit straight laced, aren't they? They're a bit, um, you know. Yeah, they're crazy people with hammers. But I like the really crazy people with hammers and, um, you know, hooks and bats and cudgels and sticks. Um, they're far more amusing. So, uh, they are the flagellants, of course. So, the Old World is a dangerous and often cruel place, where war, plague, and the vagaries of nature can destroy whole towns and force their inhabitants to become beggars, vagabonds, and brigands. It is probably no wonder that many are driven mad by the terrible hardships that they suffer. Many see their condition as a sign uh, that the realms of men are about to collapse, and they are living in the last days of a dying world. It is quite common for these hordes of penniless zealots to band together under the leadership of some ranting madman, a preacher of apocalyptic doom. These bands travel the towns and cities of the Old World, spreading their nightmarish vision of doom and despondency. When they hear there is a battle brewing, flagellants gather together in anticipation of the final apocalyptic conflict. As the armies clash, the flagellants throw themselves into the fray in a gesture of sacrifice and doom. Due to the constant hardships um, they are forced to endure, many of them self-inflicted, flagellants feel almost no pain and are difficult to kill. 
They are also completely fearless, having long since confronted their own vision of world destruction. Nothing holds any terror for them any longer. So, um, so that's pretty cool. Pretty cool indeed. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, I think that wraps it up. Um, obviously I said I want to talk about Volmar all the time, but um, other than that, I think we've pretty much covered it all. Um, in terms of, you know, the, the cult of Sigmar and sort of, uh, you know, what they're about. So, um, yeah, hopefully that's, that's uh, you know, given you a good, good indication of, uh, you know, a big part of life in the Empire. So, uh, guys, if you enjoyed this video, please do comment, like, and subscribe, and, uh, you know, let me know which bits you liked, which bits you didn't like, even. Um, you know, it all, it all helps me form better content for you guys, and, uh, and I do want to do that. So, you know, please do uh, get in touch, because, uh, yeah, it would be really appreciated. So, guys, if you like this video, comment, like, subscribe, and I will see you in the next one. Have a good day, guys.